you know, Limp Bizkit on in on the uh, what was it? tour they went on i oh, can't remember but you know one of the big one like on stage props they had they brought out this big toilet and they flushed images of nsync and backstreet or something sick like, burn really guys <laughs> huh? yeah yeah well exactly so 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 clever so so clever fred brunch hit it boys I don't think we've ever been the guys do this and girls do this thing, but something happened to me today that I quite liked, and I was like, I think this is something that only dudes do, and maybe it's just because it's a very douchey kind of thing, and women are better than men, but this was a thing that I was like, I would like this to be an everybody does this thing. Go on. When you yield... And let somebody go when you're driving. What might you expect back? Uh, like for as like a thank you? Is a some sort of nice acknowledgement? Uh, I think usually just like the hand wave. You do a hand wave. Yeah. But every now and then, and this is the gold of drive. Like this is why we drive. For every now and then, this moment, it's not to get anywhere, because every now and then you'll let somebody go, and as they're turning. They will point at you. Have you ever gotten that before? No. I've gotten that like six times in my life, and every time I'm so happy. It makes my I, that day. That would make my day, yeah. And I was like, I don't think I've ever done that before. I don't have the confidence to – but like the, the guy who's going, he's taking a left. I have the right of way, and I let him go. He's got a big truck. No uh, one, yeah. Everyone's I feel like mean to that guy. Of the percentage of people that like point, uh, like 99% have to be truck guys. St- stereotypes – we're in play here. <laughs> yeah. Um the guy the guy's turning and he's like I think someone was in the car talking to him, like he was not paying attention he to what the person was saying. In. He was like <laughs> probably saying something like that's my guy. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's just something that I wish everybody would do. I don't want to water it down totally, but I would say everybody I can't say everybody because I, I don't have the confidence to do this. But like I don't know, every But I think that every everybody... like twenty times someone lets you go, just have the the stupid bravado to be like I don't yes. think it is, I don't think it necessarily even has to be like a point. I think that maybe we should just start getting more creative with the ways that we acknowledge a person in a car. Like I might like every twenty times might start blowing a kiss. Right, I toss a macarena at them. Yeah, just, right. Yeah, just really throw them off their game and be like, "Damn, that person's that person's got something going on, and I like it. It's made my day." All right, we're installing dashboard cams <laughs> and driving around to see how many people let us go. And what we do in return. It's like carpool like, karaoke, but exactly. like carpool uh, charades. So like the easy one would be dab on them. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, I, I think that you would have to point and dab. D- d- You'd be like, this one's for you. Yeah, but that also seems uh, quite dangerous. You're taking both hands off the wheel to dab. That's true. That's But like if you gave like a... A one hand on the wheel with like a... Like sir, a, ma'am? With like a <laughs> quick point and then bam! <laughs> yeah be pretty good uh how about a quick little this would be way too dangerous but depending on if you've had years of training it's like toss a quick little magic trick at him <laughs> <laughs> nobody would believe just a that. quick rabbit out of the hat yeah just like why has that guy got a card in his hair he doesn't have where did that card go You're just like that's not my card <laughs> uh a quick little like hat tip yeah might be might be a good one yeah, I like tipping the hat. Mm-hmm. Tipping the hat is way more vocalized than it's actually done in practice, correct? Uh, yeah, like an old, you had to give him the old tip of the cap. Yes. You, Unless I don't you play th- baseball. I don't think you've ever. Has a tip of the so, cap like, ever happened outside of baseball or like the 1800s? Um, Everybody wears like. Uh, probably not. Like top hats? No, probably not. Yeah. But I'd like that done more in practice as, as well. Just give a li- nice little tip of the cap. That's a tough tough one, though, because then, like, you're giving a tip of the cap, but you're also revealing your hat hair. Yeah. If, if I'm wearing a hat out, I'm not taking my hat off because I probably have, like, very embarrassing hat hair. This one's for the Patreon people. Oh, yeah. That's not great. Yeah, but hat hair when you got long hair is o- it's, it's okay. You, you There's just, like, a very, very big flat. difference between certain areas of your of your head. 
My hair is looking pretty good these days, especially in a hat. I agree. Yeah. I mean, lo- long hair always works. Although, I'll tell you what. I'm really considering cutting mine, like buzzing it. So now I have to fucking get away from people like you. Not to That's be mean. Fair. It's but like, now become in style. Like being right. long hair was a unique thing a little while that ago. That was my thing. Before. And that was like people were sw- people wanted me to cut my hair. Oh, they yeah. would say, hey, cut, why are you growing it long? Oh, come on. Why can't you look like everybody else? And Especially I know on it TV. sounds silly to act like like I, I, I was the only person with long hair. <laughs> I was. Well, like on TV. Yeah. Like a lot of people on TV are like very clean cut, very um, boring. Yeah, just – I've been trying to push back against that forever. I hope I'm making some progress there. Um, my place of work is cool about it, but I feel like you're right. A lot of people, a lot of places are like, it's got to be. I'm, I want to say conservative, but maybe that's uh, maybe that's the wrong word. But right, clean like, like clean and like this and then like everything just so and. Nah, be yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there was a, quite a bit of pushback uh, l- last week when I uh, debuted the the middle part. Yeah, I don't think it was. So I, I'll tell you what. I've been through the the look that you did. I've been through that before. I don't think it was the middle part. I think it's just that you let it fall and you didn't put anything in it. That to the person who has it is more exciting, especially if they're growing their hair for the first time or growing their hair when they hadn't in a while. You're more excited about it because it's you're like accomplishing something. Yeah, it's different. You're working toward like you you this I did not have this before, and everybody who sees it is going to feel either like they like it a lot or like they don't like it so much. Yeah. So you're gonna get at the very least you're gonna get a lot of conversation about it. Which for me, I I like attention on my own terms, um, but I don't like I, I'm more like like hey like we're all having the same conversation about something not like hey look at what he's wearing and what he's doing <laughs> yeah. and stuff um, so I don't I, I'm not a crazy big fan of that I enjoyed the memes the like Miles sending uh, the uh, what's uh, his name from uh, Malcolm Chris Masterson in the yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah was that his character's name there was uh, Reese there was Malcolm there was Dewey and shoot I got all of them except uh, Francis Francis yeah that's right Francis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who I bet Francis ended up being a, a totally fine kid. Definitely. That was it. That that show He got out I, on I his know own. That we terms. just did like a dudes in dudes who drive trucks might point at you stereotype. But I feel like that show, as did everything back in the day, leaned into a lot more stereotypes than they might have meant. Like, oh, this kid doesn't get great grades. So we have to send him to military school and he's gonna be a disaster in military school and he's always gonna be trying to like Find, to wiggle his way out of stuff and like a, a lot of kids aren't nailing it when they're young like that, that i don't think that francis and that don't don't go back and be like he burned someone's house down in this one episode i don't remember every episode but also how fucked i have up, confidence in francis or, how fucked up is it that that show is called malcolm in the middle and there's four brothers yeah, but I think that it's probably I didn't know about this at the time, but it's probably something about um middle child syndrome. Yeah, but he's not even a middle child. Yeah, he is. No, because there's we're just, there's four of them. Yeah, he's the third of four. That's not middle. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Middle is like in there's between. There's two middle children in that because there's four. Well, there's two middle children, but it's about Malcolm. Yeah, oh, I mean, well, that's because they they're picking between Reese and Malcolm and. That I, show isn't very kind to Reese. I feel like you can only be a middle child. If you're dead in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would lean towards that. I consider myself a middle child. I'm one of four children. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But I, I think that, that middle child stuff kind of manifests itself in different ways. I, I honestly don't even understand all of these stereotypes about middle child <laughs> syndrome. Because yeah. I, I have so many other syndromes that when I learned about middle child syndrome a few years ago, I was like, I... This is way this is way on the list, low on the uh, list of priorities. Yeah, right, please. <laughs> I will figure that out uh much, much later. Uh tell you what, we've got a an award show episode that we didn't expect coming because no. I think our interest has just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled on award shows. But not only did the Grammys just happen and the Grammys knocked our socks off, Oscar nominations are now out and now we've got some crazy catching up to do if we want to try to follow the Oscars the way we enjoyed the Grammys. 
We've, we've been a big Oscars podcast the last couple of years, but Grammys were amazing. We're going to talk to John Norris in a few minutes about the, the Grammys. Just John Norris, legend, has been around music forever. Um, we talked a little bit on about this on the stream on Monday, but this was the best Grammys show, I think, ever. It was the best that I can remember watching. Um, and just to say that was stunning is uh, a severe understatement because I didn't even know if I was going to watch the Grammys. I had no interest. I was surprised that you were in from the beginning. You were like hanging out for a little bit at the beginning of the Grammys and we were doing the typical, you text with your friends during the Grammys thing. Mm -hmm. And I think they just never let, I, th I think their strategy was smart because they never let you get away. They opened with, okay, here's Harry Styles. And you're like, cool. And then right after they're like, all right, now Billie Eilish. And you're like, well, I'm not gonna turn, it turn it off during Billie <laughs> right. Eilish. Like Billie Eilish is happening right now. Be like, I, it would be irresponsible as a consumer <laughs> of. Okay, Heim's there now. Like, and they just kept coming. And they threw Taylor Swift out there very quickly. Yeah, I think the one thing they messed up with is I would have uh, had Taylor go with the country artists because they had Miranda Lambert and another country artist. Um, I haven't listened to country in forever. Morris. So. Uh, Marin Morris, no, so, uh, somebody else, uh, it was all women, but, uh, the first, uh, woman kicked it off. And oh, then yes, they went, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, they went to Miranda Lambert, then Marin Morris. I would have tossed Taylor Swift in there, because I think that there's a real chance that you're losing the, I'll check it out for Billie Eilish and Dua Lipa people, when you go to a bunch of artists who people might not listen to. Marin Morris is more mainstream, so... She probably held people's attention there, but I honestly, I probably would have like tossed Taylor in there. I know that she's not country anymore, but I don't know. We lie about what Taylor Swift is all the time. <laughs> so if we're going to lie about how good she is. Well, let's also lie about what genre she is and throw her in there. Uh, before we get to John Norris, um, we'll discuss this between ourselves because we don't know John Norris well enough to know if he's going to want to tolerate this conversation. Uh, the Dua Lipa thing. Mm-hmm. Dua Lipa rocked America's world. <laughs> yeah. Rocked the yeah. world's world. Yeah. Uh, it was... I, I didn't know anything about Dua, Dua Lipa uh, other than uh, I knew that she was the ex-girlfriend of the lead singer from yeah, Lanny. Yeah, you, you, you referenced that a lot. And I was like, I had, I didn't know this. I also don't know anything about Dua Lipa. But right. I I do think it's funny that like That's you've kind of had that, that in your back pocket. Like, whenever it's needed to come up. Well, it was just one thing that I always knew. And I, like, I n have never brought it up because I don't really know who Dua Lipa is. Um, and I know that, like, that guy can't stop talking about it. Uh. It's, like, his whole thing is that, like, I'm very sad because I'm coming off of a breakup. And he made, like, an entire album, made a couple albums about it. And so uh, now I get it because Dua Lipa, is, I just... I, is now America's girlfriend. Yeah, I was going to say, not to do the, like, oh, like, the, I, I think this celebrity is so hot, or, like, I'm in love with this celebrity, but, like, everybody was in love yes. with Dua Lipa. Um, I was texting with uh, with Fidelberg about this, and uh, I also brought it up on the stream, but I think that Dua Lipa's performance and then later... Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's performance, but uh, Dua Lipa kind of broke us in for the Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion performance, and that whether or not you've been alone with somebody, you could be with your partner and seeing them every day, and like, I think that people, everybody is lonely during this time, and that loneliness ma manifests itself in a million different ways. And one of them is, is I think that like people aren't seeing like sexual, like sexy things, you mm -hmm. know, like uh Feidelberg brought up, he was like, if people, if they're alone, like maybe like they're watching porn or something to like address like l literal loneliness yeah, or yeah. whatever. But people like out in the wild, right? Like people <laughs> yeah. aren't just, aren't like seeing uh, enough like award shows or like even just going out in public and being like, oh, like, look at that. Like, look at that couple over there. They're gorgeous. I feel like 
if you go out and you see like a, a very attractive couple, you're yeah. not even thinking of it because like you're all wearing masks and you're, you're probably wearing just, sweatpants. It's just part of your brain <laughs> yeah. that isn't working, and it's a stupid kind of primitive part of our brain. But I think that when people watch Dua Lipa's performance and Cardi B and Megan The Stallion, I bet that like there was a sensory overload <laughs> of. Like probably for lack of a better term, just like straight up horniness of people watching something sexual for the first time in a million years. Blindsided horniness. Exactly right. Just yes. kind of like caught off guard by especially stuff that because kind of always is on TV. And, and she did. I think there was like an intentional blindsidedness to that because set us up. She yes, yeah, she set us up. She was like, "This is going to be pretty boring. I'm just going to stand here in front of this whatever scene that was in the background." And then it goes dark for a second, and she just takes off the clothes. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, really blindsided us. It's a lot to handle. Levitating uh, with the standing up and just kind of singing at the camera, mic stand, uh, unharmed, so not Father John Misty style. That was kind of setting us up. But it shows how 2021 our brains are. We were texting about it. We were like, I guess this is what she, I guess this is what this performance is, huh? <laughs> right. Like neither of us were allowing at all for like the pr- pr- someone's going to start dancing now, <laughs> or so there's going to be an outfit change or something. It was an uh, all. Ti- it was an all time bamboozle, I'll tell you, because we were waiting for a bad performance because all the performances to that point had been just like knockouts yeah. and just kind of waiting for one that that was a bit of a letdown, and it started off pretty boring and pretty static and. I texted you. I was like, okay, this one is is probably the first stinker. First miss, yeah. And uh yep, uh that didn't that didn't age well. Ever I I've, I've never seen people explode though the way they did during that not performance, right? But maybe not, the, during that performance, every group text I was in, every person I was texting like all at the same time was like she did that or <laughs> yeah. like, "Oh damn." It's or literally hot. Hey, do I <laughs> like Right, just a, a lot. I don't think we even knew how to talk like that anymore, just because we haven't inferred. No, I don't think anybody was like had like the cool thing to say. I think it was just a lot of like, "Holy smokes, <laughs> damn, wow!" Talk, talk a lot about stonks on the rise. A lot of bonks on the rise. Okay. Um, oh, bonks. Yeah, bon- yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, yeah the horny, horny bonks. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering why you were like upset. I that was that some it... term I didn't know. It. I no. thought you were saying like I thought you were using bonk to describe a, a part of the body, and I was no. like, ugh, not that kind of, <laughs> no. not that kind of cast. No, you bonk people when they're horny. Yeah. That. Yeah. F- I mean, Fidelberg but nobody was bonking got... each other. Everybody was like, I, I, I I'm not gonna be a hypocrite. I mean, Feidelberg got destroyed by those memes and it was the funniest thing in the world uh let's bring in john norris and uh talk about the rest of this dang program joining us via via the internet from new york the great john norris what's up man what's up man how's it going good it's super cool to have you talk grammys talk i mean pete just said when you called you are kitted up i don't know anything about soccer but i'm trying to get into it and uh we'll talk i guess i'll start with the soccer question what is the you'll never walk alone significance? Because I was watching Ted Lasso the other day. They played that song in it. I've seen friends tweet it during soccer games. Uh, and then uh, Brittany Howard played it at the In Memoriam thing. And soccer fans were really excited about it. I just know it as a Jerry and the Pacemakers song. And why do soccer fans like Jerry and the Pacemakers? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you more history on this than you even want. This is going to, I don't want to take up too much of this episode explain, answering this question. But so the song was originally written for the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Carousel back in the 19, I want to say 30s or 40s. And yes, you're right. During the Pacemakers did do a cover of it. The reason they did a cover of it is because it, because it is to all the football world known as Liverpool Football Club's anthem. And during the Pacemakers, fake iconic Liverpool band. And um, so embrace that song. And that is a song that all LFC fans sing multiple times at every match. And um, we have a song too, Real Madrid does, but it's a much newer song. I won't, I won't, I won't, uh, I will spare you my rendition of it. But, um, but anyway, so You'll Never Walk Alone is, is known throughout the football world is Liverpool's song. And, um, but of course they used it in the, in memoriam section uh, the other night at the Grammys. Plus they used it in a commercial, which was 
Interesting. Did, I, was she, uh, did you see the commercial? Like Brittany Howard was doing in the commercial too. Yeah. It was a, was a Jack Daniels commercial. There were a lot of like yeah. extremely music heavy commercials during the Grammys, which I don't remember being that being the case. Like obviously it's geared towards music, but like I feel like every commercial was so heavy on on music. It felt kind of like the Super Bowl in that respect. You know how they'll they'll do they'll do ads or they'll do commercials just for the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. and it felt like there were a bunch more of those this time for the Grammys, right? Right. So, I I mean we'll uh, have to get back to the soccer thing or the football thing at some point because as somebody who uh, I I follow a lot of sports, not really that I'm into MLS, shout out New England Revolution, but it seems like right? this is you're just describing it as a sport where people wear cool clothes and sing together, which is all I'm trying to do in every other aspect of my life. And nobody wants me to do that. But this would seem like it's a place where it's actually appropriate. I mean, don't they, they sing it. They sing it like American sport. Don't they sing it? I guess they don't really sing it NFL games, but they definitely sing it like college football games. Yeah. But everything is so loud at professional sporting events. It's like in the States, it's crazy. The music is, they want to give the illusion that everything's super loud instead of just trusting the people there to make it super loud. So I'm all for what they do in, in, in football where everyone's just yelling, hooting and hollering, being all crazy. I'm all for that. Uh, what did you think of this year's Grammys? Because I didn't really. I've I've always been into the Grammys. I don't take the awards super seriously because, or I, I'll say I take them with a grain of grain of salt. But Pete and I agree. This year's show was an actual party. They didn't really give out awards. They kind of just like skipped that part this year. But this was like a, this was a legitimate party. Yeah. Well. Two things about that. First of all, they've been they've been giving out less and less awards as the years have gone on with each year. And I mean, I remember when, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they would hand out, I want to say, between 15 and 20 awards in the main show. They don't do that anymore. They were like, if I'm not mistaken, there were 10 or 11 handed out in the main show the other night. That is out of a total of, mind you, 84 categories. That's how many categories. So, so you know, the real Grammy stands were watching at 3 p.m. Eastern when they started handing out the, um, what they call the premiere ceremony. It used to be called the pre-tell, like pre-tell or pre-show. But that's where they hand out the vast majority of the awards. Um, so definitely the awards have become sort of an afterthought. I mean, this year they really felt that way. I think there were something like 25 performances, 27 performances in all this year. Um, uh, So that's, I mean, that's one thing. As far as the way they handled it, I don't know. Like I had different feelings about it. At first, the first few acts, like Harry Styles, Billie Eilish, and Haim, like all three, I mean, they were all, I love them all. And I thought they they all sounded great. They, They were great performances. But I was a little weirded out by that sort of, club Grammy vibe, you know, where everyone was sitting around watching each other. I was on Twitter, of course, because I hardly ever leave Twitter. And, and, um, and, and a lot of people liked it. Like a lot of people really liked that whole, they felt it looked like artists being supportive of one another. Whereas I just felt like they would cut to, you know, they do a cutaway of Harry Styles watching Billie Eilish or whatever. And I, I just felt like, he must feel so awkward. Like, but I don't know. What did you, did you, what did you guys think? Did you, I, did you I, like I, it? I thought it was like an episode of Jules Holland, which was, uh, oh, yeah. which was really cool. And I think that also for like the casual, uh, watcher, it didn't really let you go. Like Pete was saying that he was kind of going to keep an eye on it maybe, but then I don't know, Pete, you're a few minutes into it and you're like, yeah. I, I can't turn it off during this or I can't turn it off during this. Yeah, I, I thought it was I thought it was different and unique. And I thought that like they did I, the soundstage format seemed very uh, intimate and uh, it allowed later on, I guess it allowed them to get super creative with the performances and stuff. But I, I feel we talked about uh, how it's sort of like shifted away from the awards. I feel like the Grammys have kind of shifted away from even the music in, in recent years where it's kind of just more about the spectacle. And I feel like this year it's scaled back 
and kind of made it more about the music and sort of just like the intimate vibe of the performances. And I really like that. Yeah, I, I love that it wasn't like grand. There were definitely grand moments. I mean, WAP was as grand as you're going to get. But I mean, really, prior to that, like, I don't know, Taylor Swift and like there there were a bunch of like lights put up in that little weird house where she was hanging out with Jack Antonoff and cosplay or w- whatever he was doing. Like that was kind of the most yeah. production there was. I, I like that. You mentioned um, WAP and, and the whole Megan Hardy section. That was big. Uh, the Dua Lipa thing looked, I mean, it looked big on TV. I don't know how, how big a production it, it actually physically was. Um, I, it was, it was really only that first section of, of those three bands that I, I felt like felt like you were saying, had a real soundstage feel, Pete. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, you know, I guess it, some people liked it. I, clearly some people liked it. Um, you know, I think that it was more creative than just, cutting away to London or, you know, New York or wherever and having a performance, all performances remote. So, you know. Yeah, I definitely think the, the remote performance things are, are quite awkward a lot of the times. And uh, yeah. I, and I don't even have a problem with how many performances they had and, like, how few awards that they handed out on TV, especially because, like, over the past year, everybody has been so hungry for entertainment and for live music that it seemed like if there was a year to get away with it with how little award the actual awards uh how little focus they put on the actual awards this would be the year to do that yeah you know they all uh, it's interesting what they do too is um and it's kind of telling when you watch the pre-show the pre-awards um you you kind of notice which which awards are saved for the main show? Now, always the big four, record, song, album, and best new artist are going to be in the main show. But they vary every year which ones they hand out in the main show. And in the last few years, definitely you see more pop awards, more, more hip-hop. Well, there were only two hip-hop awards in the main show, I think, this year. Um, and... And and definitely, definitely over the last 10 years, less and less and less rock to the point where this year, not a single rock category was handed out in the main show. And that's, I mean, sign of the times, right? I mean, it is what it is, you know, but I know rock fans aren't really, I saw, I saw, I saw some rock fans, one of their big bitching points about Sunday night was, um, was the Eddie Van Halen tribute which I actually thought, I agree with my friend Jim, who writes for Variety, that they handle that well. I'm sorry to get off topic. You no, guys, please, like no. Rambling. Van Halen That's is very All this topic. podcast yeah. is, is getting off topic. So if you write at home. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, I, I actually thought the whole In Memoriam segment was really well, really well done. And, and, and I, was, I was so happy that certain people were in there that maybe in other years might not have if, they, if it hadn't been such a long segment. Um, but, uh, the way that they did Eddie, you know, just showing his guitar and showing 20 seconds or something of him, his performance, you know, there were Ben Halen fans or Eddie fans saying that wasn't enough and they should have done more. But my friend Jim writing in variety yesterday said, you can't, there's no way you could have done it in a way that Van Halen fans would have been happy with it. I mean, you, you, you certainly didn't want to have some all-star rock and roll hall of fame style jam playing what Panama or something, you know, I mean, I think, I think it was tastefully done and well done. And um, so I didn't have a problem with that, but uh, go on. I, I don't mean to like pog the, no, I'll say, I mean, I'll just point out to your point, Van Halen fans aren't happy with Van Halen half of the time. So they're not going yeah. like, depending on who's singing or I don't know, like they brought out Gary Sharon to give like a tribute to uh, Eddie Van Halen or something. Van Halen fans would have been pissed. I'll say Van Halen fans, sneaky, uh, sensitive group of fans. They got mad at Billie Eilish when a child was like, I don't know who Van Halen is. <laughs> Children typically don't know who Van Halen is. Um, and I mean, for the, the rock awards. And for the Rock Awards, I mean, there's only so many times that you can invite Imagine Dragons to give the same speech at the Grammys when they win Best Rock Band every year. Yeah, there's... there's... This is true. 
It's, it's a no-win situation well, with the Rock fans. The Rock, the aren't real creative. They aren't real creative in terms of who they nominate right. for Rock Awards. It tends to be super repetitive. And speaking of Rock, by the way, I mean, the, the, the fact that the Strokes, God love them, only this year won their first Grammy. I mean, and I, I went back and looked after I heard that st stat. And I, it's the fact that Is This It, which, I mean, almost universally, their debut album is considered one of the great debut albums of all time. You know, like it's up there with of an underground and whatever. I mean, it is, but it was not even nominated for anything, not even alternative for the year that it, the, the, it was eligible. And then Nas as well. Nas had never won a Grammy until this year. And Illmatic, again, one of the most acclaimed hip hop records of all time, wasn't even nominated the year it was, uh, it was eligible. So, so I, this, this blew my mind that Nas was not, and I, I agree with you on the strokes, absolute insanity. So I went back and I looked up, uh, because Nas had been nominated before. Um, so King's disease won best either. rap album this year. Uh, he's been nominated 14 times, four times for best rap album. And that's, I am hip hop is dead. And, uh, Oh, and Nas. Those were also nominated, but not Illmatic, which is crazy. So I'm going through, I'm like, Hip Hop is Dead, I think, is like a, a deserving album of best rap album. How does that not win? And then I see, you see Graduation came out that year, and Kanye's on a heater. So you totally understand why Kanye West wins that Grammy. But you're like, the biggest takeaway is, how is Illmatic, or it was written even, how, how are they sure. never nominated for even Best Rap Album? They didn't start giving out the award until 1996. So Illmatic wouldn't qualify for Best Rap Album yeah. because it didn't exist. But even so, the cover, like the way the Grammys viewed music was so different back then. And let's say, I mean, to put it delicately, let's just say they had blinders on for various reasons that Illmatic wouldn't be nominated for Album of the Year. Illmatic is considered one of the greatest albums right. of all time. I mean, it, from a 2021 point of view, it not only should there have been a rap album category, but, but Illmatic should have been up for album of the year, 100%, right? I mean, what the famous statistic, what is that, is, is that um, Outkast was the last hip hop record to win album of the year, right? Uh, for Speaker Box Love Below, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 2004, I think it was the last... I'm almost sure that's yeah. I mean, it the would have been. I mean, Kendrick and Macklemore are the only uh, real recent contenders, and neither yeah. of those won. That was, I think, 1989 won that year. Mm -hmm. They also do. I I couldn't stand, and maybe I I got to get off this like weird Beyonce uh, obsession I have, where I'm not even the biggest Beyonce fan, but I think that different conversations drive me crazy about Beyonce. Like I. I I frequently bring up to people, I say, hey, who do you think's a better vocalist, Adele or Beyonce? And when they say Adele, I lose my mind because Beyonce is just like an all galaxy talent. The Grammys have not been kind to Beyonce and they threw themselves a damn celebration on Sunday night being like, Be oh, you tied this record, Beyonce. Oh, most wins. Okay. you t Oh, now you broke the record. You have the most wins ever. Beyonce in the Grammys. We're cool, right? They have given her one real Grammy for single ladies. That is the only and not to say that like I, I'm pretty sure they would I'm pretty sure they would take exception to you calling one out of twenty eight a, a real Grammy. But um but in any case, I know I, I know what you're saying. And um and uh I mean it's ridiculous. I I mean the the Adele the you know, mentioning Adele too, it brings to mind you know, that moment this year where Billy won to everyone's surprise record of the year and then did that whole thing of like, I feel embarrassed and, 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 you know, Megan, this is really yours. And that, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I, I just, you know, it, it's not Billy's fault. She won. Right. So like that, that idea of sort of like apologizing for winning, it's like, it is what it is. You know, I, I mean, like, on the Grammys, the fact that Megan didn't win or anyone else didn't win, and when I don't think anyone really, I mean, I love Billy and I more power to her. I thought last year's sweep was a bit much, but but whatever. Um, 
for that to win record of the year, just that was one of those moments where you like, you know, it's one of those like, what are you doing, Grammys? You know, like you get it right more often. Well, no, I won't say more often than not, but way more than you used to back in the day that we were talking about back when, you know, the omatic, the, the omatic days, right? But um, I don't know. What did you, what was your thought when she, I just felt like, I mean, it's, it was very sweet of her to say that, but I always imagine myself seeing, you know, if you're Megan sitting there or in the case of the year that Adele won and she sort of apologized to Beyonce, to be Beyonce or Megan sitting there, I, I'm, I don't know. It's cringeworthy to me. It's like, I'd be like, girl, you won. Just yeah. enjoy the moment. Yeah. Have I, your moment. I thought, it was, I thought it was heartbreaking and I'm glad you brought it up because like we talked a, a week ago about some of like Billie Eilish's anxiety and just so, like the way that she sort of criticizes yeah. herself and, and really thinks about kind of everything and, and holds herself to like a higher standard. So for her to go up there and like profusely apologize for like an uncomfortable amount of time, like it was uncomfortable. I, I think for like, for everybody watching and for everybody, uh, like probably, for, probably Megan as well. Uh, but also just like really heartbreaking oh, yeah. because you know, go like in Billie Eilish's head that she is like, I'm going to get torn to shreds because of this. Everybody's going to hate me. And she just doesn't isn't able to enjoy any of that. So it's it's it really sucked. What do you think the world would have been like if social media existed for the boy band craze of Backstreet Boys, 98 Degrees, In Sync, and everything? Because BTS is associated with this army of fans they have on social media. And I thought growing up that like the worst people could be to each other were two of my sisters who like one was an NSYNC fan. One was a Backstreet Boys fan. And that was considered like this kind of like ruthless, uh, like thing that existed. And my God, it could have been so much worse. It, it could have been worse, you know, look, so the thing about boy bands and that, and that era that they were, that they were as massive as they were is that, what you had counterbalancing them, and this was, you know, the height of the TRL era, right? Um, what you had sort of counterbalancing them were the sort of dudes of rap rock. And, you know, one of, one of just to use an example, Fred Durst's favorite targets, and it's, you know, shooting fish in a barrel, to be honest, was going after boy bands, you know, fucking... Can I say, can I? Oh, yeah. Oh, you, let her rip. <laughs> yeah. We are PG-13, I think I probably my friend. Like, <laughs> um, you know, you know, Limp Bizkit on, in, on the, uh, what was the tour they went on? Oh, I can't remember. But, you know, one of the big, one, like on stage props, they, had, they brought out this big toilet and they flushed images of NSYNC and Backstreet or something. Sick it's burn. Like, really, guys? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Exactly. So, so, so clever, so, so clever, Fred. Um, but I don't know. I, that, but see, that whole, that whole kind of aggro male mentality that was such a, a significant part of, of, uh, of pop culture. I mean, throughout the 90s, I love the way that, you know, having, as you guys well know, lived through that decade. Um, and been on, you know, talking about music and pop culture in that decade. It's funny how people remember it as being a, a you know progressive time and music change, especially on the rock side, you know. And obviously, it was in some people's minds the golden age of hip hop. But dude, there was so much. I mean, we now we now use toxic masculinity as like a a, a common sort of identifier and we we people know it when they see it and how when it manifests itself dude i mean you only have to look at the britney documentary to to see how sort of casually that was that mentality was a part of the way things were back then and like so when i think about and i'm just i'm really not answering your question about social media and if it had existed but i think social media is is you know it's always been just like fuel to whatever we are i mean it just it all it does is it just it's gasoline for whatever 
where for where I guess whatever we are. And I I just think that 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 kind of mentality, you know, Eminem slut shaming women in videos and songs, it just wouldn't fly anymore. It doesn't fly anymore. If 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 he, I just, I mean, it's so shut down in a minute. It, at least at a general pop culture level. Yes, there's plenty of hip hop songs about getting your dick sucked, et cetera, of course, but not uh, not in the way not in the way that it was, and certainly not from a rock pr perspective, because like we were saying earlier, rock is so faded from sort of primacy, you know, that um, you just don't hear it. Uh, that really doesn't answer the question about what if social media existed. No, though. but it, I don't I mean, know. It uh, does. It does raise well, the 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 point though, and like speaks to the behavior. Yeah, I, I mean, it, you're right though. It probably just would have kind of heightened whatever was going on. So it would have been a lot louder version of a lot of bad things. And obviously, social media right now heightens a lot of bad things. People just use it to tear each other up, but they'd probably use it to right. tear each other up in a, a, a different way back then uh the bts thing all right uh dynamite was wasn't was just kind of widely okay, ignored by of last year right no i'm not kidding my fa it's, my my favorite pop single it last is so, year. Good. so good i <laughs> i i mean and and i and i feel like Pete, there wasn't a consensus except among clearly the, the army i think there was a consensus that it was as good as it was like, I can never, I don't think I'll ever get tired of that song. And it just puts a smile on your face. And, and there's been a lot of times for when people have not had smiles on their faces past year. And I don't, I don't know why anyone finds that song anything other than just pure bliss. And um, the fact that it got one nomination and dude, I love Gaga and everyone, people who follow me know I love Gaga and I've interviewed her a bunch of times and we're, I consider her a pal. So and I'm not, this is not anything against rain on me. I'm glad it got an, won an award, but the fact that dynamite had to lose that one award. Um, and then, I mean, I was on like throughout the entire show watching because all I, all it took, I knew it would happen. It it's almost like you can, you, I knew it was going to happen the second I tweeted something about BTS being robbed, but it looked like it looks like they're going to close the show, even though they were robbed. Oh, holy shit. Within 10 minutes, 400 likes, <laughs> five, you know, five, you know, 200, 100 comments. Like the BTS I mean, army like, undefeated. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. Um, so it's just it's, it's it's a real shame that that song didn't get more shine. I, and it doesn't make sense to me. It's like. It's, you know, if that song had been done by, say, Bruno Mars, it probably would have gotten Record of the Year or yeah. Song of the Year nomination. Yeah. yeah. You know? So, like, well, I really believe it. quick time out. The audio got a little jumbly here. So, we'll pick it up with John talking about how artists were viewed, critiqued, et cetera, back then, uh, just going off of the Britney doc. I don't need to tell you guys that when the Britney, um, when the Britney doc aired, there was a lot of conversation about Justin, which led to a lot of conversation about Timberlake, that is, not Bieber. Um, and which led to a lot of conversation about Janet and the Super Bowl. And, you know, I lived through all that. And people have asked me in the year, and there's a there was a clip from an interview I did with Timberlake a couple of years after uh, Crimea River and all that stuff went down. And um, and also a couple. It was a year, I think, a year after the Super Bowl with Janet. And um, and people ask me, you know, they've asked me in the years since, you know, didn't you, didn't you feel like it was shitty the way he kind of threw her under the bus or whatever? And I guess my answer to that is really that I was so pissed off at the way America kind of threw her under the bus and and like and 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 thought that was so so shocking and just you know, outrageous. My attitude was it's, it's a breast, get the fuck over it, you know? And I, I, I understand there will be people that would say, John, it's a family entertainment, it's the NFL. You can't be, I don't, I'm sorry. No, no. There's a hell of a lot more things to worry about in the world than a bare breast. So I was so at the time, I just remember being so disgusted by this, 
you know, overly judgmental uh, country's reaction to it, that what Justin did or didn't do, I don't know. I didn't really think that much of it at the time. Um, and likewise, Crimea River, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I interviewed Brittany probably four times in that period of 99 to when I left 2008. Um, and my, my interactions with her were always great. And I mean, I don't, I like to think I treated people, treat people decently. And I just not that kind of, when I see that in the, in the documentary, that montage of like these just pricks, like tabloid pricks asking her this. You know, I said this to someone else recently. I was like, can you imagine Ariana Grande today being asked in a press conference about her breasts? For oh, fuck's sake. God. She'd like, not only would she walk out, she'd probably like smack the guy, rightly so, you know, like, I mean, I mean, I don't know. There was there was a yeah, moment during the Britney topic. documentary where she was in an interview and they like they asked her about uh, the the wife of like some politician, I think it was, or it might have been a politician themselves. But like they're like, this person said they want to literally shoot you. Right, like you ought to be shot. I was like, like, what? I was alive during this, and I don't remember it being this absurd. Even I don't remember that. I, a lot of some of the a lot of that those stories that would live for a few days and tabloid stuff around her after a while, I just, I don't know. I, maybe I was getting them out cause I was doing more. I think I was doing more, um, like indie rock stuff by then. Cause I finally was able to do like music that I hadn't, you know, my history there was a lot of what I did in the nineties was because we were the news operation until Sway came along and Serena came along and Gideon came along, we didn't really, it wasn't very big. It was basically me and Kurt and Tabitha and for the early part of that decade. So a lot of what I would do for news would be stuff Kurt didn't want to do, right? So that would be the pure pop stuff, except for Madonna, because Kurt always got to do Madonna until finally I did. And I, I actually you know, knew her, but when it came to interviews, um, it was always him, which is fine. Um, but so like he, he wouldn't want to do, he definitely would, was not going to do boy bands. Um, and he had no interest in, you know, talking to Brittany or Christina or any of that. And um, so that would always fall on me and that was fine. And also for a long time, news didn't really cover that much indie rock in the nineties, I guess, alt rock, but it was, a lot of that was left to like 120 minutes and for all the nation. Um, but finally, I got to by the by the early two thousands. I had been there long enough, and and like I was just bitching about shit left and right. That they're like just to shut him up, let him do, go talk to you know, Grizzly Bear or Vampire Weekend or whoever you know he wants to talk to. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry to bring things down. No, <laughs> no, no. I mean, that's I'm I'm just thinking of like how just different the the world is but like the different like the industry is and the music industry just uh, everything like I, I i work in television kind of and i'm aware working in it now that it used to be so much different where i, I don't know just for for some reason you talking about like uh kurt loader would get these guys and like he'd, he'd kind of take his pick and everything like that like it's it seems like everything more now is kind of streamlined where there aren't, uh, there aren't like these like huge big dogs, and I don't know. It, it seems that everything is a lot more, uh, yeah. I, I guess just just streamlined. It's just a, it's just a different world. But also, you. Can... I'll tell you what, because MTV's relevance in because MTV's clout has been so reduced relative to other media outlets over the last fifteen years, and this is nothing against MTV. I still love them. I still. We left, I left there on the greatest terms and that's always going to be family to me. And, and no matter who's there and very few people are still there from when I was there, but um, I, you know, I just, they don't, they're not automatically going to get a Beyonce interview anymore. Hmm. Whereas, you know, up, I, certainly up through the mid two thousands, you, that you, it was a given 
you know, that you would get, and, and especially if you had sway there or whatever. Um, but so like throughout the nineties, you know, MTV was, you know, got the, anyone they essentially anyone they wanted. I can't, you can count on one hand, the number of people who were like, would hardly ever grant MTV an interview, Kurt Cobain being one of them. I think he only did one or two interviews and Kurt Loder did both of them. I never did. I certainly never got to interview Nirvana. I mean, I met Kurt, I met Kurt once at the VMAs, but, um, but nowadays, you know, major artists, the Ariana's, the Gaga's, the, the Adele's, the Beyonce's, they, you know, they, you know, when they have a new project, you can really predict who they'll, who they'll be willing to give time to. And it's very, it's a very limited number of outlets. It's, 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 it's maybe Zane Lowe, right? It's the New York Times, NPR, if they're more indie sort of minded people, The Guardian, uh, and then, you know, some of the big talk shows like the probably Ellen, probably whoever, you know, Fallon. That's it. And that's it. And because they can go places that they know are friendly territory. You, Any artist knows they're going to go on Ellen and Fallon, and it's just going to be a love fest, and there, there's not going to be a challenging question. I'm sure, you guys saw the clips that have resurfaced in the last few weeks since kind of since the Britney thing of Letterman mm -hmm. being what some people would say is shitty to Lindsay Lohan, Paris Hilton, you know, and seen through the lens of kind of today and being reevaluated. I have mixed feelings about that. I, Paris Hilton's got a got a rich history of being shitty to people, so it's not like I'm gonna I'm gonna shed too many tears for Paris Hilton, but um, you know, um, it, it is it's to answer your question though, I mean about I mean things have things have changed so much so much. I think that the artist and and publicist has a lot more control now. And they can just say no to things. And my social media has a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. You can just, you can just like choreograph your message and your, and, and your, what you want to put out there and, and pick and choose. Be a lot more picky about it. I'll ask a quick a BTS question. Do you think that they're going to yeah. be around much longer? Because I didn't realize they've been, a, I've been thinking of getting into them because I like dynamite so much. And honestly, I think it's the only song I know by them. But they've been around for 11 years, and that sounds like that's pretty much how boy bands go. Like, it should be any day now, and I don't want to get invested and get, have my heart broken. In fact, it's longer than a lot of boy bands last, right? I mean, um, I don't know that, that I don't know that K-pop plays necessarily by the same rules that Western boy bands have in the past. I know that, and I'm, not, I'm no K-pop maven, so don't quote me on this, but I think that... Um, mandatory military service is coming up soon for at least some of the guys in that band. And um, so I think maybe a hiatus is coming up. I don't, I don't know. I, I can't speak super um, uh, intelligently about where they're at career wise, but um, I, I, I dynamite is, and, and I know people, you know, the, the real stands, the army folks will say, where have you been? Is a, why haven't you been supportive of them until dynamite? Why did it take an English language you know, pop dance disco song to for you to get behind him. And I look, I mean, I'm not, I don't claim to have been with BTS from the beginning, but I'm happy for them for whatever kind of shine they can get. Um, I, I don't know, hard, hard, hard to say. I don't know. Um, I don't know where we're even at with Western boy bands. You know, I think we're at a kind of a lull, yeah. you know, in that, sense also bts has like 90 members so they could like stand to lose a couple and still survive yeah. so yeah do what bands used to do this, this never happens anymore i know it, maybe it's because bands don't exist but in my day um or i guess it was a little before my day but a band would just my lose its lead singer be like it's cool we got a different guy <laughs> and we're still that band like the idea of i'll use the example of maroon 5 because because like Adam Levine was quoted recently saying like, Hey man, what happened to bands? And it's like, well, you killed yours. You kind of <laughs> yeah. happened to, to bands, dude. But, um, imagine if Maroon 5 
This would just never happen. If Adam Levine left Maroon 5 and Maroon 5 was like, hey, we got someone new. Like, I hope you give us a chance. Like, the, things like the Eagles replacing, um, why can't I think of his name? Uh, Randy Meisner with Timothy B. Schmidt or whatever. Like, they, or Sir Van Halen switching that's lead singers. Before your time. Right. And that's definitely before your time. But like that just used to happen. Um, there would just be that turnover, and it'd be like, "Hey, these are the stars. You're uh, you got posters of us on your wall. Look, we had to say bye to one of them, and we're gonna keep going." Now it's I mean, Blink One Eighty Two did it, and everybody was like, "This isn't Blink One Eighty Two. Exactly, exactly. Like it, it just I feel like it just does, right. doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, I don't think it happens anymore either. Um, and when I when I well. When I don't like it is when like, iconic bands who've lost a singer who's among the most iconic singers in music history, in the case of Queen or In Excess, do this thing where they bring on, granted, no res no disrespect to, to uh, Adam Lambert, but like, talk about shoes to fill. And, like, You're right. I mean, I mean like... Or, and, and honestly, I felt that way about Michael Hutchins, too. Like, not at the level of Freddie Mercury, but um, I don't know. I understand that they've got an amazing catalog and the remaining members don't want to just give it up. But really, like, and of course, in the case of NXS, didn't they have a contest to replace their singer? Wasn't that? Oh, happened? yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, this brings up a question that is very near and dear to the podcast. Uh, did you see Bohemian Rhapsody and what did you think of Bohemian Rhapsody, the movie? Uh, uh, hmm. Yes, I did see it. Um, well, I love Rami Malek. I'll leave, I mean, I, that's the, that's the, the nicest. And I, and I <laughs> actually liked Rami Malek's performance. Just Some saying, people man. felt like, <laughs> yeah, you're going just in the saying, right direction. Right, you right, can right. Go ahead. And... You're, you're going where we want you to go. <laughs> Some just say. Like, he... Some people feel like the look was distracting. His, um, the the um, in the mouth area was distracting, but um, I that wasn't my issue with it. My yes, issue with it was same. that it was just kind of a standard, dial, you know, dial it up. Paint by numbers. And also. That, yeah. And also that they exactly, and that they whitewashed, you know, they the his illness, and I don't know. I, Straight I don't, up didn't tell didn't, the truth, right? Right. <laughs> they, yeah. I mean, they they messed didn't, around with like the timeline of the band so much that was infuriating. But like, I I wish when uh, he said like when he tells the band that like he has AIDS or whatever, I wish like the someone in the band was like we've never seen you. We don't know anything about your love life. We don't know, like, because ba based on this movie that we're living, you, like, you've got your, your wife that you kind of hang around and, with a, a little bit, but like, they just so, yeah. I mean, it was, it was disgraceful how much they just ignored this person's life when pretending to tell his story. And I don't know what they were right. afraid of, but, Man, oh man! And everybody was like, "This movie rules! It has Queen music." Yeah, that, that bugged <laughs> me. They were like, "The music yeah, I mean, was so that, good." I'm that, like, "That's because it's by Queen, you idiot!" <laughs> like you put Queen in any movie. Of course, of course. And the people who were saying they loved it are the people that don't even really want to think about the reality of who right. Freddie was or, the, or his life, or you know that and that and you know, and honestly, when you consider that Brian May was everything had to be signed off by him and the and the estate everything that went in that movie, it just, it, it's, it makes me sad that that's the way it's sort of like scrubbed version of Freddie is what they want. They, that's what they want to leave the world with, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I did not see rocket man. I don't know. Maybe did you like rocket, rocket man, man was more? better. Much Rock, better. Rocket man was more of like a jukebox musical. And, uh, oh. I, I, I'm a big mama Mia two head. Pete and I both are, uh, I like I, I like that kind of thing. If you want to do a movie like that, then by all means. If you like, want to just if like you're, if you're not gonna tell the the like the truth and and really kind of let us in, then make it fun make it and a different. Fun production, yeah. Just yeah. yeah. Add in a storyline with a bunch of different fathers and everything. Just basically make every movie Mama more Mia. like Mamma Mia <laughs> and Mamma Mia Two. And uh, I'm on board. But John, awesome talking to you. 
appreciate so much. We we know they were coming up on uh, your uh, your football team's game coming up. Which who do you support? Between, between minutes, between minutes into kickoff. Oh, let me let me just check the phone here. Well, I uh, we're the worst. No score yet. I mean, we're we're on, it's it's not going to be easy today either. We, we're up one nil in this series. It's Champions League's round of sixteen. Um, but but we've been having we've been injury riddled this season, and um, so we're going to be we will be fortunate to get out of this round. So, but I'm well. You'll never walk alone, just or whatever version of it is for Real Madrid. So. Right. Uh, thank you for coming on. This is awesome. Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. Love to talk again sometime. Love that John Norris. He is awesome. Hell yeah. Thoughtful guy. Yeah. Right? Like, he's got... I I, 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 I like people like that. Yeah. Who, even if, if you ask them a question that, like, they hadn't really considered, they're like, all right, I'm going to consider this on the fly. Versus, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's very easy to, like, not give something your full attention everything. He seems like he's more like us than maybe initially would uh, would meet the eye. So cool, dude. Awesome talking to him. Uh, we'll have to have him back on. But uh, the BTS thing, I uh, I'm just gonna do it. I think starting Friday. I think starting Friday, Diving I'm just in. going to start listening to BTS. I've got I'm overdue on some stuff. I've got to check out and listen to. Got to watch a million movies if we're gonna be able to talk about the Oscars. But I think that Friday. I begin listening to BTS. Uh, I was going to mention this, but I didn't want to get too off topic. But um, I think that a lot of BTS fans have um, like call me maybe syndrome where um, yeah. where they do more than just that song. Right. Ugh. And I think that that a lot of BTS people are like, shut up about dynamite. I like dynamite's a good song. I, I, I really like it. There's more to BTS than dynamite. And I, I have that with Carly Rae Jepsen with call me maybe. But I've seen that reaction already, and I respect it. You know what BTS needs to do then? They got to pull a Vampire Weekend. One time at the beginning, uh, one time they put Vampire Weekend at a music festival up against uh, somebody else that was really big. And uh, I think Vampire Weekend like wasn't psyched about it or something, and they were like, well, this stinks because if anybody uh, – checks us out it's going to be like oh well like let's go hear a song or two of vampire weekend then we'll just go to this other stage so they opened by playing a punk three times in a row that rules and so. they were like if, if this is what well, we're going to be to you <laughs> yeah here we're just so bts needs to do an entire concert of, of dynamite and honestly i would go th- if you <laughs> promised me there was a show of it, it I, again i'm trying to get into bts but if you're like hey we're going to start you off with an hour and 40 minutes of dynamite over and over and over again i'd be like i don't know how that makes me more of a bts or a a smarter bts fan but it probably makes me more of a bts fan uh we talked about this on the stream earlier this week too uh thanks to everybody who hung out by the way Uh, yeah very cool keep doing that uh we'll be back monday and uh i've also got the we've got the bonus episode coming out friday uh to the patreon people so get on patreon if you haven't yeah patreon.com slash listen to brunch We'd love to have you, and we're almost halfway to the uh, the sleepover. We that are we really, almost really halfway. Want. This is going to become like a recurring uh, bit that we're almost halfway to the sleepover, but we're closer to halfway to the sleepover than we were last week. That's awesome. So yep. we're like we're almost almost halfway to the sleepover. So also stunned by uh, the the amount of people that have done year commitments on patreon which you can do uh for a reduced price Save you can, some money you can commit for a year uh i love that because there is absolutely no reason why anybody should us. trust us yeah. to do something that we've promised to do uh for a full year so we do plan on doing it for the full year appreciate the show of faith what i was saying was uh for bts we talked about it on the stream uh the there are a million members of BTS. We talked about this a little bit with John Norris, but like large group, the one guy, the the, the lead guy, the the one lead guy who uh, was at the forefront of the Grammys performance. We are enamored with that guy. Definitely, I have no idea how old these young men are. I have no, I do know they've they've been at it for a while. It's actually kind of cool. I was perusing their Wikipedia page, and they seem to have like done it like bands did it in like 
like chipped the, the away. The 80s and stuff, right? Like yeah. they're like like playing clubs and working their way up. And I'm like, that's not what boy bands do. They, <laughs> right. just, they just like they just decided, they, they like, decide they're a band. band. Yeah. You are the okay. You hey, do you want to join this thing? It's automatically the most popular <laughs> right. thing in the world. Okay, cool. You're a millionaire. Now. That is You're literally what happened to like One world. Direction. They're yeah, just like uh, Backstreet Boys and yeah. Sync, same thing. They're like, look, we're gonna we're gonna warm you up by having you play a couple of malls, but that's if anything, that's just like we want to get you used to playing in front of crowds and stuff. Right. Like you, if we wanted, we could speed this right up to <laughs> you have the number one song in the country. So good for BTS. Yeah, the dude that takes the first verse in Dynamite, he's got this charisma. He's got this charm where. Every look he's given you is just like, like kind of flirting with you, but you're like, nah, he's not flirting with with me. It's like I'm not he's good too enough cool. for him. Yeah, yeah. He's got he, he he's just he, he's just got it. He's uh he's gonna they be are. a star. They, he's gonna be a star. <laughs> look, uh, <laughs> watch out. You know what? I'll say it. The whole group, they're gonna be on big. the rise, up yeah. and coming. I feel like you, they you, could you, they could win the best new artist at the Grammys in like you three always to four years. Send me like, hey, this is gonna infuriate you tweets, and it's always somebody like, hey, check out this thing that's been around forever. <laughs> I could see you sending me a tweet of somebody being like, I'm call like I'm getting into BTS, and I'm calling it this time next year. You're gonna wish you'd gotten into them too. <laughs> like that is like me now. Like I'm like biggest. I'm thinking about. BT, BTS kind of electric. I'm in on them. Oh, I know. Like, I know I'm very late. <laughs> oh, on, for sure. Yeah. But one of my friends t- texted me during Haim's performance and was like, not to be that guy, but it is cool to be like a 2013 Haim fan, seeing where they are. And yeah, it's kind of like a Taylor adjacent thing where they've aligned with the right people and everything. Mm-hmm. But. 2013 Heim fans popping on the Grammys, seeing it's, them, seeing it, them kill it, feels it, good. It feels good to 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 appreciate that while also like not gate gatekeeping. And I haven't seen a lot of Heim gatekeeping. I think that it's a lot of like Heim fans are glad that people are becoming more and more in on Heim, and Heim's like becoming more mainstream because Heim's just done the same shit right forever. Everybody, everybody <laughs> wins if Heim gets big, right. like. If, if you're into Heim, then cool. But like music gets better if like a really good rock band is one of the big. Like we were, we hit on it a bit with John Norris. That like no one cares about rock anymore. No one wants to. And I know that Heim. I don't think won anything at the Grammys, but the fact that they they're that, up for the album that, of the year. That, yeah, that Wimp Three was nominated. Yeah, that's kind of big. Yeah, yeah. So watch out for Heim. They're going to be popular <laughs> as well. We're giving you all those tips. Uh, I'm gonna get. Let's do second straight week of "Let Me Blow Your Mind." Okay. Don't stop. Don't start now. Great Dua Lipa song. I learned this last night. The bass line in that the bass in that song is great. Right? It's all you're hearing really. So much of the verse and the the verse and the chorus basically is just drum, bass, Dua. It's all you're getting. Also, another re- thing I learned, Dua Lipa's name is Dua Lipa. Really cool. Did you know that bass is not a real bass? Really? It's just a MIDI bass. Yeah. Just like someone played it on a keyboard. Oh. Tell you what. Cool. Didn't blow my mind, but. it'll blow When you listen to it, it'll blow your mind because it really sounds real. That's It's uh like the Seinfeld theme. Okay. That, yeah. That's not a. It's real, not a real bass. Yeah, I know that. It plays on a, on a keyboard. So and it changes every uh, every episode, I think. Yeah, he yeah. would like re-record it to however whatever uh, tempo Jerry was pacing, which in is the incredible. Intro. Yeah, that guy is an interesting dude. I don't know if you, I get a lot of targeted stuff from him on really? Instagram. I forget his name. It's uh, it's very similar. I feel like it's similar to uh. Dua Lipa? Seinfeld 2000's name. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Seinfeld music guy. His name is... Oh, Jonathan Wolf. Yeah. And Seinfeld 2000's name, I think, is... I, I won't dox him. <laughs> although it's out there. <laughs> yeah. Just Google it. Um, but, yeah, Jonathan Wolf is a very eccentric man. He posts uh, fun, eccentric videos of him just being like, Hey, Will and Grace fans! I'm gonna play the like I I made the music for Will and Grace, and you're like, I know, I follow you. And he's <laughs> like, I'm gonna play it real quick. He's great. He's delightful. Um, that's uh, I think that kind of wraps up 
any and all Grammy talk. Uh, I mean, get ready for Silk Sonic to take over your life. Yeah, folks. that's gonna be. I... Bruno Mars hasn't gotten old yet. And it's surprising that he hasn't gotten old because everything he does is so freaking derivative of something you've already heard. And, and it's, it's so like, freaking grand. Like, yeah. everybody should be like, this guy is fucking obnoxious. But he's so good yes. that nobody is like, fuck this guy. He's too over the top. Yeah, talent wins out, I think. Yeah. with that, that's You can get away with stuff if you are so, so, so talented. Uh, Got to put in a quick request uh, to the world. Every time Taylor Swift talks, stop saying Easter egg. Did you see oh, that? No. It was trending yesterday. It was like Taylor Swift dropped an Easter egg in her speech. And I was like, I can't have a third one of these albums. <laughs> it's incredible that we've done this much Grammys talk and we uh, haven't even like discussed the takeaway. But I think that it's just you would like to avoid it. No, I mean, I don't know what else there is to say. Right. With, with, yeah, like, yeah, right. Everything right. she does is going, everything she does is the best and it's perfect. <laughs> and now Taylor Swift is better than the Beatles, more talented than everybody in the world. There's no way that anything she does is trite or formulaic, whatever. And look, I like trite stuff. I like formulaic stuff. It's why I like Taylor Swift. I, the stuff of, isn't it the best? Just, yeah, and, and like I hate that question being asked when the answer is no. And I feel like most of the time these days we ask, isn't this the best? The answer is no. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, I think it, it sort of like stems from we don't want to yuck anybody's yum. Don't, yeah. But also like not everything has to be the best. Things can just be they solid can just what be they like are. good to to very good to... Shout out um shout out circling back. They kind of lean into the small to mid size yeah. podcast kind of thing. I mean, not everything. There's only we had this conversation with um, shoot our uh, pal uh, Martin Rickman uh, talking about albums or something, and someone was like, "Oh, this well, it's not Thriller." It's like, yeah, it's because. Thriller is once thriller. in a once in a generation album. Yeah, there is one. Yeah. There is one thriller. So, the it, the the Taylor Swift thing, the bar is set. It's established. Anything that she puts out now, for for if that album wins album of the year, it means that everything she puts out for the rest of her career will win album of the year, and that's fine. I'm Just glad. I'm glad winning, that it hasn't I angered guess. you. I I didn't want to do like a because I know we we land in in a different different areas of enjoyment on folklore mm -hmm. i'm glad it didn't anger you uh, i'm glad that you kind of had some time to process it before it even happened exactly so it, it didn't ruin the night for you um yeah but like even for me like i i really liked folklore um and it maybe like the the my favorite album of the year based on like what i listened to but i didn't listen to a lot and i probably can tell you and admit that there was better albums that year um so I, I couldn't even take like a victory lap or anything. It was just kind of like, okay, I hope people don't go yeah. overboard with this. Yeah, and Charlotte tweeted, um, look, I'm by no means a Taylor hater, but Women in Music Part 3 and Future Nostalgia were both better than Folklore. I very much agree with that point. I also think that neither of those albums are deserving of Album of the Year, but... The first part of like, look, I'm by no means a Taylor hater. Who's a Taylor hater? There are, Nobody. Mean, like, I, I really there don't are, think. But like, I, but, I, I do think that at this point, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have to defend yourself or, and add that disclaimer to like any fair criticism of Taylor Swift. And now you do. I right. sent out a tweet uh, during, uh, during the performance. I was like. I love Taylor, but this is, like, the lamest performance of the night so far. Yeah, I don't know. There's just this weird thing. I of... hate that you have to, dis like, put that disclaimer out but there. But how many people are really hating on Taylor Swift? Like, uh, who are, are people hearing folklore being like, this sucks? It doesn't suck. It just doesn't do it. It's, it's, it's just I think bland. It's, it's just, nothing. I think it's just more of a defense mechanism used against the army because the yeah. army will just assume i do that for sure i'm like hey look right. i've given her a lot of my money as have all of us right 
I am. I have that in common with you. But the 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 army will automatically assume that you have some sort of anti Taylor agenda anytime you say something negative about Taylor, which is why the the disclaimers have to be thrown out in case somebody co- comes and catches it out of context. It's silly. It's, it's the place silly... that we are now, and it's terrible. Yeah, it sure is. Um. The, the, the present sucks, Dawson. <laughs> That's right. The Fuck, we need to get sucks. back into that. Yeah, we should bring back the present sucks, Dawson. We should bring back random reviews of uh, Dawson's Creek episodes because... Whenever we don't have anything, man, we'll just, just grab a, a Dawson's Creek episode. Uh, Oscar things are out. Oscar nominations are out. And, boy, we just didn't take in any real anything over the, the last year because I'm looking at the best picture doms. Usually, when the, the Oscar nominations come out, I'm like, I just got to see one or two things, and then I'm good. Best Picture noms. The Father, Judas and the Black Messiah, Mank, Minari, Nomadland, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, The Trial of the Chicago 7. Some of these I know I should have seen, Yeah, but I have seen two of these movies. Um, Which one? Obviously, Promising Young Woman, and what other one? Judas and the Black Messiah. Okay, I still haven't even seen Judas and the Black Messiah, and that was like very easily available to me, and yeah, everybody was done. talking about it, and I did, still didn't see it. Um, I'm a little embarrassed about that one. I'll, I'll rectify it before the Oscars, and I'm, I'm going to try to watch the rest of them, but damn, that's yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't even like heard of some of those movies. Yeah, I, I Sound of Metal is uh, highly recommended, has been highly uh, yeah, recommended. Yeah, that's the one with... Uh, Riz Ahmed. Riz Ahmed, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Nomad Land is with uh, Francis McDormand. Okay. Um, I'd seen that one and I he- got re- heard uh good things about it, so I'll definitely also check that one out. Uh, I'm very happy that Promising Young Woman got got a uh, got the nod. Oh yeah. I I I'm starting to see more and more like that people are listing that as their favorite, and I do think that uh based on what I have seen, which again is a limited sample, but I think Promising Young Woman is my favorite movie that I saw from like the last year. Yeah, it was. I would. I think I would agree with it. Uh, no, I, I honestly I preferred. Um, I care a lot. Really? Yeah. yeah. And both of those kind of take like uh, leaps. And my my main critique with Promising Young Woman was how the it assumes that you're willing to to part with the main character and. I wasn't really, and I know that. Look, no, without spoiling anything, like movies have like people go to jail and people die and stuff, and like things happen to these it's characters. Not always tidy or happy, right? And but... it's maybe it's not supposed to be pleasing, but it, I think, positioned it as a kind of like a wink at the end of like, hey, everybody won here, and I, uh, I, I. I you know, I was cool not prepared that. for that to happen. Yeah. To... She dies at the I, end. I, like, I, <laughs> there's no way of saying that. She she dies at the end. And uh, she she gets she gets some justice, which obviously this movie is about extremely uh, overdue justice. Mm-hmm. And she gets some justice, but she dies in the process. And uh, that bummed me out. But yeah. uh, obviously the topic of the movie is um uh, yeah. a horrible horrible thing yeah and um like when i say that's my favorite movie of the year it, it it's it feels tough because it feels like i've just been constantly battling and i mentioned it even too during the, the grammys thing is like constantly battling just like how horny i am for entertainment and yeah. like th- things to go back to normal so like when even a, a like a good movie comes out i'm like this is awesome yeah i'll take and man i, I will take Anything like uh, I think that if Promising Young Woman came out during like a regular year, I'd be like, "This is very good." Not probably not going to be nominated. Yeah, it would fall into um, like uh, what was the one with oh, uh, Simple Favor. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. Like good. Some things about it could be cleaned up, changed, whatever it may be, but. I'm not expecting it to to be nominated. I'm that, glad this was nominated. That's how I felt like about like Ford versus Ferrari too. Where I was like, this movie yeah, was didn't need to be. This movie was was very cool, but like probably doesn't need to be in the best picture c- category. Yeah. And I don't think that prom- I don't think the promising young woman is is. I guess I can't say that when I haven't seen a lot of them, but like I'd be surprised if it won. Well, let's okay. Let's do this uh, crazy 
experiment. Let's go through um, like just last year's movies because I'm I'm. I well, do... last year was fucking stacked. right. So, like, where would say the best thing we've seen so far? Which let's agree, it's promising. Young woman wouldn't make it. I, uh, I don't think my top ten. And just stop me when you say maybe I'd have this ahead of this. Uh, Parasite, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Knives Out. No, no. Queen and Slim. I had Queen and Slim very high. You did have it very, very high. But I would still put Queen and Slim I, above that. Yeah, I think that. Queen and Slim is better than Promising Woman. Midsommar? No. Nope. Marriage Story? No. Jojo Rabbit? <laughs> Not in a million years. Little Women? 1917? Uncut Gems? Um, No. All right, 11. You'll probably... This this might be where it came. What, what do you think my number 11 movie was? I know this is uh, tough, but... It's a movie that you'll say, well, you think this is the 11th best movie. Nobody else. Oh, um, The Irishman? I think The Irishman was, I had it 25. As 42. <laughs> yeah. I had it 42. Cold Pursuit. Oh, my God. Okay, well, yes, I would put uh, Promising Young Woman ahead of Cold Pursuit. Promising Young Woman and Cold Pursuit are, like, in the same conversation for me. <laughs> Obviously very different, but, like, I think that it's, Glory, I think Loose, that, I think that, Butter Falcon, like, Last Black Man in San Francisco, right. Hustlers, like, the, oh, there are so many movies that would be better than what so far we've seen as the best thing. But who knows? Maybe uh, the it's other It's just, mo- like, an unfair, uh, unfair, like, competition because... That's one of the better years in movies, like ever. Uh, yeah, think, in our yeah. life. Uh, and then there's this year, which is obviously, to to really no fault of its own, just a horrible year for movies. Yeah, I. Uh, so, best actress in a supporting role. They should just say best supporting actress. But um, I love the nominees. I was very excited because I thought that this was best actress, and I was going to be so happy with these nominees because it's. Um, it's two actresses, uh, pardon my ignorance, of, of whom I have not heard. Well, one of them is uh, the woman from Borat that everyone said did uh, w- was great and was okay. like the breakout star. But uh, the other three, uh, Amanda Seyfried. I'm always so afraid of Seinfeld, pronouncing yes. Seyfried. Uh, Glenn Close and Olivia Coleman. Oh boy! I would have loved if Glenn Close was up for Best Actress and Olivia Coleman yes, was like, "I am no. so down to watch Olivia Coleman just body Glenn Close and ruin yeah. that storyline every year." Yeah. and like I don't, I it's like Glenn be, Close. It's always got to be Olivia <laughs> yeah, Coleman, right? I just need it to be a bit. Yeah, uh, but that's for Best Actress. It would be dope though if in what two of the last three years Olivia Coleman bodied Glenn Close in various categories, yes. but. I mean, I could run through these. Uh, I could run through these uh, nominations, but I don't think it would do anything for anybody. Yeah. Oh, I am happy. One that I wanted. I thought it would be best actor, but he's up for best actor in a supporting role. Lakeith Stanfield Hell was yes. nominated. This is a Stanfield podcast. We we field him, as they say. Um, I don't. And, and I, yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> um, I. I don't think it's disrespectful to say that I, I bet that this is Amanda Seinfeld's first uh, nomination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do very much love that uh, the Mamma Mia cast now gets to boast another uh, Academy Award nominated actress. Oh yes, Mamma Mia Three is <laughs> yeah, going to right. the longest trailer yeah, right? ever. <laughs> like I, I want, I want, uh, I want the um, uh, Zombieland Two experience mm-hmm. where it, Zombieland Two like. Every actor, when they first made it, it was like obviously a, a good cast. But when Zombieland Two came out, there was so much time in between it that like uh, Jesse Eisenberg had been nominated, uh, Abigail Breslin had been Emma nominated, Stone. Emma Stone had been nominated. So literally, like every piece of the main cast was an Academy Award nominated or winning uh, actor. I want that so bad for Mamma Mia. Uh, on Emma Stone. Uh, podcast decision has been made. From mm-hmm. now on, it's not called Cruella or whatever it was going to be called. The Cruella Deville origin story will be called Dog Joker. Dog, bang, bang, do- gavel, yep, bang. Yep, Dog Court has ruled on that. That movie will be called Dog Joker. We've got to, and I, 
I bet it's going to be maybe via Zoom or something. But whatever movie junket they do, whatever press junket they do, we've got to be in on that. Right? Yeah. We, like, we should try to get... We, we should tell the wash to... guys, be like, listen, don't have to get us ads. Yeah. Just get us in the mix. Got to get us stone. Get us in the mix for Dog Joker. We get, we got, we got to get stone. We got to get Hauser. And we need <laughs> them to know we'll, we will be calling it Dog Joker. I was Joker going to ask. I was going to ask. I was going to ask. Faces. We have to make the commitment right now that if... If it happens, Dog Joker, we gotta call it Dog Joker. Right, just be like, hey, uh, at the end of the interview, be like, hey, um, if you could just like look into the camera and say like, hi, I'm Emma Stone. My new movie, Dog Joker, is out. Whatever. Um, I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, man, we would kill it in that sort of junket. And I don't know if typically, I've only done one uh, movie junket before where you're sitting down and the. Uh, chairs across from each other and they got the poster in the background yeah they got the poster in the background it's very cool because uh, different than i thought it would be i thought that you were legitimately in a small room and you're just sitting there in different corners but you're just in any other room it's usually just like a it's usually just like a hotel lobby exactly it and they're like uh, they're like this far apart right right you're just sitting there and you're like oh that's not this small now that changes a lot of the questions that I had, but I okay. Now we have two seconds left. Okay, uh, but the great thing about those things is is that um, it's such a grind for the actors that if you go in and you're like, we're gonna do some weird shit, make them smile. That yeah. makes them smile, makes and day. a lot of the times they are so down for it because they're just doing the same interview all goddamn day. That's right. So, but I also feel people go in there and they're like, so. What questions are you sick of? What have you been asked too much? And like they, they're like, I get to say that, not right. you. Like don't, yeah. don't do the thing. And media, media people do this all the time, where they're like, isn't the media so annoying? And it's like, well, now you're just you're, you're right. both you're the pandering. media and a rat. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> so now, like, I definitely don't trust you. And you have to get. I think I feel like you have to get really good placement to be able to pull that off. Because if you do it, if you do it in the middle, you're sort of breaking things up. Yeah. But if you do it at the end. They're exhausted and they're just like, dude, this is my last one. Fuck you. I'm we should not go, trying to do this. We should go first and be like so, Set the tone. <laughs> how many how many like annoying questions about everything have you been asked? Like, dude, it's nine in the morning. Nothing. They have coffee and everyone seems nice so far. Yeah, but I bet everyone's like, oh, I remember when you were in Superbad. It's like, yes, we all know you were in Superbad, but you've done so many great things since. Haven't they been so annoying? It's like you are the first person to bring up Superbad today. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Like, anyway, uh, look, we're cool. Um, call call your movie Dog Joker for the camera real real quick. It's just like a, we're not going to be like, oh, oh, Cruella. Like, Do you know the song? Do you know the words? We're not going to quiz you on any of that stupid stuff. Just like. Call your movie Dog Joker uh, for us, please. Thank you. Uh, do they? I don't know if they have two people sit down when, um, like, I don't, when they do junkets. Sometimes they'll have one person interviewing two, two people, actors, yeah. but I don't know if they give two spots to one to, person. To two interview, like yeah. to a one interviewer. Yeah, it's a good. I don't even think that they do the two actor thing anymore because uh, I think that Ben Affleck might have ruined that for everybody. What happened? You don't know, remember the clip of uh, it was him and Henry Cavill for uh, for Justice League and uh, and Ben Affleck was just so out of it and staring straight ahead. And they have like the slow zoom on Ben Affleck's face and he looks so fucking miserable to be there. Uh, that might have ruined it for uh, for d- double actors moving forward. That's not even that's not even the biggest uh, Ben Affleck press junket moment I've I've heard of. Oh, is it uh, Ben Affleck doing the Dunkin' Donuts press junket? No, Ben Affleck being told that Tom Brady, uh, or that, uh, was it the the Jets or the Bills or somebody beat the Patriots? No, I don't remember that. He was like, well, I'm just looking up the score of the Patriots game. I'm going to look this up real quick. Uh, Ben Affleck, Patriots score, and yeah, Bills score, okay. We're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do a quick little timeout. You guys can watch this yourselves. 
<laughs> He's disgusted. In the wait, what? There, the Rex Ryan. <laughs> That's a man yes. whose brain is totally fried, and he's just not ready for that news. Yeah. We should go to a Ben Affleck press junket and be like, look, I know everyone else here is probably being so annoying to you. Um, do you see what the Patriots score was last week? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing Rex Ryan wasn't there. He's so annoying. <laughs> what are we going to do about him? What are we going to do about Ben? N- nothing. Nothing. We're, we're nothing. <laughs> we are not going to be in his life at all. <laughs> no, he is, it's so sad. He's going to have nothing. He has to do no with, idea who we he are. Is, he's going to have nothing to do with us. We are. Fuck. That is the correct answer. <laughs>